Well, good morning. Welcome to the service here at Christ E3. Our first hymn uh, is entitled, It Is Well. Um, it sort of has some of the idea of the hymn we used to sing occasionally, It Is Well With My Soul, by Horatio Stafford. If you remember his story, he had um, gone through, his family had gone through a shipwreck on the seas, and he lost his daughters, and only his wife uh, survived um, that tragedy. But uh, this song <clears throat> has some of the same ideas, and I'd like to open with it. It's called It Is Well. It's a more of a contemporary version of it. <clears throat> and I'll need your help to sing it, because it, um, my voice is a little tricky. But in this song, there's two lines that come to mind that are very uh, meaningful um, to the idea I'm trying to get across in opening with this song is one line that says, the waves and wind still know his name. And in the Bible, there's recording uh, two storms. If you remember, the one storm was when Jesus was in the boat and he's sleeping and the disciples, you know, the water's coming in. And, uh, we gotta wake him up. So they turn to him and wake him up. Don't you care that we drown? And he said, where's your faith? And he calms the wind and the waves. So that's the first one of the winds and waves to know his name. And the other one was Peter. Uh, when Jesus Christ was out praying on the mountainside, hillside, he comes walking to them in the middle of the night, and they're in the midst of a windstorm, as you remember. And uh, they thought he was a ghost, but then he says, it's I. And Peter says, if it's you, have me come to you. Well, in that uh, scene, as long as he looked on toward Christ, his focus was on Christ, he was walking on the water. When he looked toward the problem, that's when the problems got worse and he started to sink. But Christ uh, was once again saved me. His focus was on Christ. And uh, um, my eyes are on you is the second line in, the, in this song. That reminds me of those two storms that happened. Let's give it a try. <laughs> Oh 
ask this morning that whatever you've gone through this week, that now we focus our attention on the Lord and whatever we're going through, may He help us through. Thank you, Ted, and thank you for uh, mentioning to lead us in worship this morning. And boy, what a great way to start. It's, it is well with my soul. And we might ask, is it well with your soul today? And if it's not, then I can't think of a better place to get right with your soul and to get right with the Lord. How important that is. Um, we can go through a lot of things, experience an awful lot of things. And a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of this earthly life can get us down sometimes, right? But uh, our Heavenly Father, our Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are always there to strengthen and lift us up should we allow them to and submit to them. So thank you very much, Ted. It is well. What a, that's a, that is a very short statement of faith right there. It is well with my soul. So praise the Lord for that. Well, good to see everybody here today. We're so thankful that you joined us in worship. And again, I want to thank uh, Ted and Bev for, uh, Becky, I'm sorry, for uh, uh, standing in for Faith as she's uh, on call this weekend. But uh, just a couple of things in the bullet, and there are a couple of op opportunities for church family involvement. And uh, one is a, a soap-making Work, I'm sorry, candy making workshop uh, on the 16th, and if, uh, if that uh, sounds sweet to you, <clears throat> you might want to sign up for that, how's that, so uh, that's going to be involved there, and uh, that's going to be an outreach as well, if anybody wants to invite somebody, and it'd be a good event uh, to invite um, somebody that doesn't go to our church. Also, please remember just to put down November the third, the twenty fourth. I'm sorry, that is uh, going to be our terrine dinner here at the church, Thanksgiving dinner, and that is also a great opportunity to invite people to church to join you for church and uh, a good Thanksgiving meal, family style meal afterwards. And some people might be wanting to come to that. Um, uh, we don't have it in here, but November the 3rd is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church in, around the world. And we'll be focusing on that on November the 3rd and praying. And, and we'll be getting a little bit of more information and updating on some of the uh, experiences of our brothers and sisters around the world who share our faith but do not share our freedom. Um, so if you're free today, if you live in a free country today, and we should be thankful for that, right? Um, so I believe that's all. There's not a lot of uh, uh, things this week to be too uh, too much for too much updating. But uh, anything uh, we we do meet at ten o'clock on Wednesdays. If you have Wednesdays available, Wednesday mornings for our prayer and Bible study, we'd love to invite you to that. Uh, we meet up here in the living room back there, and we'd love to have another couple people. We've had another recent. Uh, uh, church member who's been vis uh, attending with us and praying with us and would love to have that uh, that room packed out for prayer. Uh, that's 10 o'clock on Wednesdays. So with that, I'd like to invite you to join me. We're going to stand and unite our hearts in prayer together and we'll continue our time of worship. Our Holy Father, we do want to thank you for this uh, Lord's Day. We want to rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, we are thankful for our freedoms that we have as Christians. We're thankful for that at this point, Lord. And we pray you would uh, help us to use the freedoms that we have in our country today um, as opportunities uh, to make known the Lord Jesus and to proclaim his kingdom until you come, Lord. And help us to do that, Lord, uh, effectively and obediently for you, Lord. Lord, we thank you and we want to pray for uh, these upcoming elections, especially, Lord. And some are already voting. And uh, we just want to pray, Lord, uh, ahead of time, Lord, that you would give us guidance and direction. 
as we vote. Lord, we want to honor you in all that we do. We want to honor you in our voting. And, and uh, Lord, we just trust you and your Holy Spirit to guide us uh, through that process, Lord. Uh, Lord, thank you again for your goodness. Thank you for this church family, Lord, and uh, the wonderful servants that you have here. Uh, thank you how you've used this church, how you continue to use us. Lord, and what you're doing and what you have planned for us as a church family as well. Today, Lord, as we continue our time of worship, we just ask your Holy Spirit to be moving in each heart here today and to stir up each heart, to stir up the praise and worship that each of us have uh, that you alone are worthy of. And we'll thank you for it, Lord, and we ask you to do this in Jesus' name. Remain standing, if you will. The next song, uh, more familiar to you, a hymn, Before the Throne of God Above. We'll practice it, and there's also a little refrain we've added to it. Um, and if all goes well, uh, December 1st, Olivia Hemlock will be back, and we'll take this up this same song with her violin. It's just a beautiful song and with a violin. I'm sure I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are, too.
is the one risen Son of God. Praise the one risen Son of God. Thank you. You may be seated. Continue to stubbornly trust in God. So, 
King Hezekiah went to God, and he sent a messenger to the prophet Isaiah, looking for advice. Isaiah sent back a message. This is what God says, Isaiah sent this message. Don't be afraid because of the words you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have reviled me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him, so he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. And sure enough, Sennacherib did hear a rumor, and he went off to deal with it. But even from afar, Sennacherib sent Hezekiah another message, this time in writing. Look at all the other cities I conquered, he wrote. None of their gods helped them. What makes you think yours will help you? Once again, Hezekiah took the letter from Sennacherib and went back to the house of the Lord, and he spread it out before the Lord. For Hezekiah, God could be his only refuge. His back was up against the wall. The Assyrians were bearing down on him. His people in the city were hungry and frightened, and every other city that the Assyrians had attacked had been burned to the ground. And so this is what he prayed. He prayed, Lord God of Israel, your throne is above the winged creatures. You created the heavens and the earth, and you alone rule the kingdoms of this world. But just look now how Sennacherib has insulted you, the living God. It is true, our Lord, that Assyrian kings have turned nations into deserts. They destroyed the idols of wood and stone that the people of those nations had made and worshipped. But you are our Lord and our God, and we ask you to keep us safe from the Assyrian king. Then everyone in every kingdom on earth will know that you are the only God. This time, God sent Isaiah to King Hezekiah. And Isaiah encouraged Hezekiah. God has heard your prayer. God is going to rescue you and this whole city and give you a great victory. The king of Assyria will not even get to the city and he will turn back and never return. And the very next verse in the Bible says, And that night the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. Now remember the psalm we were memorizing, Psalm 46? where we memorize the verse that said, God will help her when the morning dawns. All of the Assyrian soldiers camping around the city of Jerusalem, threatening them and mocking God, when they got up in the morning, were dead. And just like God promised, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed, went home and lived in Nineveh, and never came back. God had truly helped them, like the psalm says. Oh, and remember that prophecy that Isaiah had said way back in the beginning of our, of our story today, that Sennacherib would fall by the sword in his own land? Well, that happened too. Back in his homeland of Nineveh, one day when he was worshipping his false gods, two of his sons snuck up behind him and killed him, and a third son took his throne. Now, you may understand why the next part of this psalm may have been written. This is the next part that we're going to memorize. Let's read it together. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Yes. In this true historical event, these Israelites had experienced a situation where, well, it was hopeless, or it seemed to them to be. They were going to surely be destroyed, burned to a pulp, destroying the city completely, right to the ground, and killing everyone or making them captives. 
but God. But God was their fortress, and because they trusted in him and came to him for help, they experienced a victory that, well, would be told for generations. Even encouraging us today when we see the threats of war and violence all around us, or when we feel trapped in a scary situation that seems hopeless, we can hide these words in our hearts and trust in God. So, boys and girls, memorize this part over the next two weeks. And listen, if you can recite all of these verses that we have learned so far by next week, you can win a candy bar or a ring pop. Even some of the adults might want that. Someone will pass out the coloring sheet for you now. See you next time. faith for that lesson that was pretty neat how it turned out there and I think it's definitely we are thankful that we know the Lord of hosts and we can be part of his family as we go to praise time does anybody have anything to share today go to bed Well, we got up to Salamanca, New York to visit Sam's sister, which we haven't seen for quite a while. And I just praise God that we were able to make it up there. And we had such an enjoyable visit with her. And uh, she also informed us that she found Jesus. Okay. Praise God, yes. How nice. Anybody else have anything to share today? I would say we've uh, been praying for uh, Jason's wife, uh, Crystal, and she has been making some progress uh, the last couple of weeks and has been able to eat some regular food in that. And uh, Actually, we didn't get a chance to talk with her yesterday. We were riding bikes on the new trail, Dick. Uh, and uh, uh, she was with Jaslyn on, a, on a, some kind of a scooter there, but she looked very, looked smiling and everything, and she looked better than she has. So praise God for that. Anybody else have anything to share? If not, oh, Dick. This is a minor in the grand scheme of things, but uh, we've been painting at uh, York Foundry, which is in Erie. Uh, it's a oh building that's up to 80 feet high, and if you've spent much time in Erie, uh, but in the fall the wind blows all the time, and definitely a problem for our work. We'd wanted to uh, complete it in September, and I had told them that, but they added on uh, a section on Cher Cherry Street, right on the street, 80 feet high, a uh, place surrounded by parking lots, a uh, soccer field, a boat yard, uh, so really a tough thing to do. And we had to have the street block, part of the street blocked off. We have a, you know, get some special equipment to reach this, and it's 80 feet high and so on. And uh, uh, like I said, normally the wind blows all the time, and, and I just couldn't see how it was going to happen with the wind blowing, but somehow this week, we got three beautiful days and the wind didn't blow. And uh, we got it done. So, like I said, in the grand scheme of things, this is nothing. But for me, it was a big deal. And I'm grateful that uh, God provided us uh, good weather for those days anyway. And, and God does hold us all together. As we know, you know, our, our bodies wouldn't be together if, if God's grace didn't hold us together. So, Thanks, Dick, for sharing. We can go to prayer then. <clears throat> uh, 
I don't think I'd want to be 80 feet high on a still day. <laughs> but I'm thankful the wind was calm that day. Good for it. God is so faithful. I think it's in order to count those small blessings as well as the big ones. Because we have no idea how many times God is there to take care of us, overshadow us. Isn't that true? And thank you for sharing that today. Lord, we're so grateful for this privilege of coming to you in prayer. Oh God, we're thankful to hear that this precious relative has come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. What a wonderful report. We pray for these loved ones, and so often we wonder, Lord, will they ever come to you? And when someone reports that, here's a loved one that came to the Lord, we rejoice, knowing that our loved ones too, even though they might not yet make that surrender, have that opportunity, and we'll keep right on praying that God will minister and bring them to you. We thank you for the good report regarding Crystal, and ask, O oh God, that you would continue to minister to that need. Thank you for the progress. Thank you for what you're doing. And, O oh God, would you continue to minister to that need. And we'll thank you, and we'll give you praise. Lord, we pray for Wilma's sister, Harriet, who will be going under radiation treatment very soon. They're preparing her for radiation for this cancer. Oh God, we ask you to be present with her. Take away all anxiousness that she might have. And Lord, we just place this whole situation in your hands. We are so well aware that cancer is not too hard for you. And so, Lord, we're just praying that you would minister to Harriet and bring that healing touch that she needs in her body. With our God, all things are possible. Lord, we continue to remember Henry in prayer, this young child, two years old, with a brain tumor. And ask, O oh God, that you would minister in a special way to that need. We know, Lord, that you're able, and we want to give you praise and honor and glory. Lord, that young life we're claiming for you and thanking you in advance for all that you're going to do. Lord, we continue to bring Tom before you and ask that you would continue to minister in his body that healing touch that comes from above. Be with our officer, Jared. Protect him. Keep him safe, we pray. That's our prayer for him, Lord, that you will just keep him safe. And Lord, we'll thank you in advance. We place our country's many needs before you and the wars that are going on in our world. We lay them all before you because we have confidence, Lord, that you're in control. And Lord, we want you to be in control. Work and move in a very special way and we'll thank you. And oh God, there are those here today that have hearts that are heavy because of burdens they're carrying. Oh Lord, as we're praying this morning, minister to those needs and give them the authority to just cast that care upon you, knowing, Lord, that you care. For that individual <clears throat> that needs you today in a special way, May this service not conclude until they've been met in a very special way in your presence. And as the word of God goes forward today, give us ears to hear and hearts to apply the word of God to our hearts that we might not sin against you. We'll thank you. We'll give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So let go my soul and trust in Him, the waves and wind still know His name. So let go my soul and trust in Him, the waves and wind still
I would like to invite you to take your Bibles and open them up to John chapter 2. That's where we are today. The person of Jesus and the gospel of John. As we go through this, we're asking the question, who in the world is Jesus Christ? And what have I done with him? What have you done with him? What have we done with the person of Jesus? The gospels... are really in New Testament history books. And they are accounts of the encounters that people had with the person of Jesus in that particular time frame and how their lives were affected by Jesus. Not all encounters with God are the same. Um, some encounters with God encourage us. Some may rebuke us. Some encounters with God might correct us or convict us, but all encounters with God are meant to change us. So we remember the signs as we've been going through this, the signs in the book of John. Not all of them that Jesus did are written down in the book of John. There were many, many other signs he continues to tell us. But the signs that the Apostle John refers to are purposeful signs and were intended to accomplish three things. And I finally put these in the bulletin so you wouldn't be scrambling to write them down so it's on the back panel of your bulletin. But these signs are intended to, number one, point to some aspect of Jesus' identity or specifically to his divinity. Secondly, this, a sign is designed to be an unmistakable, miraculous indicator that Jesus is God's only Messiah, I'm sorry, Israel's only Messiah, God's only Son, and the world's only Savior. And the third thing a sign is typically doing, it highlights something presently occurring in the life of the audience, that is the people where Jesus was ministering and working, that was in part a foreshadowing of some later greater event or prophecy that was yet to be more fully revealed or accomplished. And we're looking at one of those today. Signs in the Gospels of John are God encounters because they are designed to affect a person's view of and relationship with the Lord Jesus. So we're going to look at Jesus as he, in the temple, Jesus cleansing the temple today, part of our lesson. John chapter 2, verse 13 and following. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple. He found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and money changers were sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told them, and he, and he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. So both the previous lesson of Jesus turning the water into wine at the wedding of Cana and Jesus cleansing the temple in Jerusalem are God encounters. They're not exactly the same signs. Jesus cleansing the temple wasn't exactly a miracle. The wedding at Cana was. But they were both God encounters and designed to change people. Some would say that the miraculous signs of turning water into wine are more miraculous works of God than the encounters that you and I have in our everyday life. And I guess I would have to say that I'm not too sure about that. There are certainly of a different nature, of a different manifestation, typically, than other miracles in the Bible. But I guess I think that God changing a heart and saving a soul is still a pretty miraculous event, no matter how you look at it. 
When God alters the course of two people's lives, when he changes the circumstances of your day and manipulates your time and your space, changes and addresses the weather conditions and the traffic patterns in order to get you to connect with one other person, I think that's a miracle. You don't know it. You may or may not have been aware of it. But it was God working a miracle to prevent, to provide a God encounter between you and one other person. How many today have encountered God this week? Thank you. Hallelujah. <laughs> lots of hands, lots of hands flying up today. Um, I believe that's pretty miraculous. I believe those things are pretty miraculous. When you pray with a person regarding a family member, family strife, or family divisions, and God answers that prayer and makes a person's, uh, works in a person's heart and changes a person's family relations in two days, I consider that a pretty invasive, undeniable miracle. So when someone asks, who has encountered God today? If you don't raise your hand, then you're not paying attention. I saw that in a bumper sticker one time. The bumper sticker just said, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. And I thought, I'm not outraged at anything at the moment. But I have taken that and applied that to this. If you don't raise your hand, to say, I have encountered God this week, then you may not be paying attention. So today we're in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, if you recall, Jesus performs a miracle, displays his glory, and the disciples put their faith in him. Not everybody, because not everybody was aware of what took place at that miracle. It was Jesus kind of allowing somebody else to take credit for what took place. You remember that? But he revealed his glory and the disciples, his closest disciples, believed in him. Together with the doctrine or teachings of Christ and the Son of God, this section is about Jesus' salvation. Jesus and salvation that he provides. In our verses today, verses 13 through 25, Jesus addresses the religious status, particularly of the Jewish leaders. While this is a literal historical account, it does seem a bit symbolic in that it does provide us with a bit of a look at Jesus' ministry of disciple making for all of us. Jesus typically connects with others, provides evidence of who he is, and begins a purifying work starting with the religious leaders. When we are born again, that is the beginning of Christ's work in each of us. He saves us into his family and then begins molding us, the Bible says, into the image of his son, Romans 8 and verse 29. That's a purifying process that he begins working on us, even before we're saved. But especially once we trust in him, he begins to... Make us into that new creation that he's already created us to be. So we see the, prob or the problem in the offense presented here in verse 13. And our, sort of our focus today is that Jesus lived in the secular, but his heart was in the spiritual. Jesus has a way of blurring the lines between that which is secular and that which is sacred. John chapter 2 verse 13 says, The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he, dro he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold pigeons... Take these away and do not make my father's house a house of prayer, a house of trade. The Jewish Passover is a process or a celebration of remembering the blood 
of the Lamb, God's people were passed over when it came to God pouring out his judgment upon the Egyptians, among whom his people, the Israelites, lived. And God said, if you take, a, if you take the blood of a lamb and put it on the door of your doorposts of your home, when I come by to strike down the firstborn of all the dead in Egypt, my people will be preserved that judgment. And so they did that. And God's people were spared. Not only that, but God's people came through the judgment as it was being poured out. They also It also represents God's people being led, that is the Passover, God's people being led through the wilderness and being delivered from Pharaoh's army, if you remember that story. Then escaping through the other miracle of the Red Sea. And for God doing another miracle of providing for them for 40 years of food and water, everything they needed as they wandered. They never starved. They never were defeated. And their clothes and their shoes never wore out. So yes, Passover would have been a very, very important celebration for the people. Yet the hearts of the money changers and the merchants and the religious leaders were just a mess. Because they had allowed the lines between the secular and the sacred or the spiritual to be blurred. The temple activities were sacred and they were spiritual. The sales of animals had become secular. Actually, the sales of the animals were also spiritual because they were there initially as people would come from all over the area to celebrate Passover. They didn't just bring all their sheep and their cows and their oxen. They would typically come to Jerusalem. They would purchase a sacrifice or something for the temple worship with their money from somebody that was there to sell them livestock. That was part of their worship. That was part of their having taken care of their sins. But what began to take place is these merchants become scandalous. And they began to think, you know what, these people are in quite a pickle. They come here with no, no animals to sacrifice, no way to really worship the Lord properly, no way to get their sins taken care of, no way to remember Passover. And they're depending on us. <laughs> you can just hear the little fiendish wheels turning in their minds. And so they began to jack up the prices. And Jesus eventually in the book of Matthew, it's recorded that he says, How dare you make my father's house a house of, a house of thieves and robbers? So they were really cheating the people. And, and uh, they believed they were uh, elevating the prices. And the people were uh, charged large sums of money for their sacrifices and their animals. So we see this kind of this uh, this taking place. The, the secular and the spiritual or the sacred has been blurred. The lines have been blurred. What once was an act of worship of people selling animals even to the people so they could worship. Now it was a business. Now it was uh, cheating others. So the, interesting enough, I think, for me, is that Jesus first went, when he came back to Jerusalem, he first went to the religious uh, establishment's seat, to the seat of the religious establishment. He didn't go to the pagans. He didn't go to the Gentiles. He didn't go to the criminals' hideouts. He went to the temple of all places. Perhaps we would agree that the Christian religion could benefit from some of the similar house clean, cleaning today. In fact, I believe that exactly what we might be seeing taking place within the church leadership and the Christian culture in America today, especially over the last five to ten years. So Jesus did not go first to the place of sin, but to the house of worship of his own people and began working on the religious hearts of the people there. Because the line between the secular and the sacred had become blurry. And so Jesus' response, sometimes all we get out of this whole story is like Jesus was angry. 
He abused those people, kind of like the wedding at Canaan. All we get out of that, all some people get out of that story is, oh no, Jesus turned water into wine? How could he have done that? What a mess that, what was he thinking? So let's, let's not let the fact that Jesus, the way he acted in righteous indignation, cause us to miss what was going on here. So the fact that he mentions a place of trade, the, the temple being a place of trade, implies that things had exceeded the boundaries for sacrifice and worship to being a point of being focused on making a profit. So there are lines for them of between their work and their making money and their worship had become blurred. It's all about the blurring of lines. Suddenly there's no demarcation in between that and this. But it's all one thing. It's all mishmashed. And it's really not secular, but it's not, not certainly not spiritual. It's not sacred either. Others were charging and cheating the people. Oh, how the lines between secular and sacred are so easily blurred. That which is worldly so easily becomes that which becomes part of our religion. Some may view worldly as taking on different clothing styles or hairstyles or music styles of the world in which they live. And out of that becomes, this is how the church is always dressed and this is how we should not continue to dress. And if you change the style to match the culture, then you're letting the devil rule your life. You ever heard that? We begin to judge people by the outside, yeah, by their hair, by their style, by their music. That's all outward things. It's easy to say, I listen to this music, I wear this type of clothing, and I keep my hair like this. That makes me a pretty religious person in the eyes of everybody else. While inside, guess what? Judgmental, gossiping, slandering, hating, defying, not loving, cheating, lying, focusing on ourselves. This is, how, this is how lines get blurred. We criticize, we judge anything that might be new, new in the church, as though it was from the world, or it's a curse, or is of the devil. So easy, and we are so easily tempted to make the outside of a person that which we judge or evaluate. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, as Israel was trying to figure out which king they were going to get, the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on the man's appearance, that is, as they were selecting the king, or on his height or his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. And unfortunately, we do that in the church. We look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks where? At the hairstyle. Oh, oh no, oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I got that all turned around. The Lord looks upon the style of music that it is in the genre. Oh, 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 no, oh, no, my goodness. Oh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. The Lord looks on the heart. We can't see the heart. We, can, we can't judge the heart. We can see and judge outward appearance. I can remember I had a beard. When they fought the first time in the history of Moody Bible Institute, they began to allow the, they released some restrictions and allowed the men to, get, to begin to grow beards. They didn't allow the women to. But the men could grow beards if they wanted to. And I was coming home to get married. I was getting cleaned up and everything and so I had I had shaved and I went to my church it was a church not this is not the Southern Baptist Church this is a church I was attending just before I went to Moody and I had shaved my beard and went to church and as I walked in the pastor said over the microphone brother Jeff good to have you back I see you got right with the Lord and shaved that's what he said and he was as serious as a heart attack. Yeah, yeah. 
here I am, clean, clean shaven. So it's easy to, it's easy to, to see the outside and judge people on the outside. We still, it's, it's, it's hard not to, but we still do it. God looks on the heart, the attitudes, our beliefs, and the character of the innermost part of a being. But oh, how the deceiver loves to blur those lines between and obscure the standards and divide and deceive God's people regarding truth. How he loves to mess us up. So verse 15 and following, here it is. Here's the scenario. In making a whip of cords, Jesus drove them out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables and told those who sold pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. Basically tells them to get these things out. Their passion for God and for their worship had faded. They were taking what was should be, have been sacred, that is the temple, and should have been spiritual, which was the Passover, and it would just become one more thing for them to make money. Their hearts weren't in it. The religious leaders' hearts weren't in it, and that's probably the most concerning aspect of all of it. Probably some of the non-religious leaders had purer hearts than religious leaders did. Now we get those things turned around. So we want to see, I want us to look a little bit about the background of what's taking place here, the, the greater, bigger picture of Jesus cleansing the temple. He's not just being a meanie. He was righteously indignant. He was upset. And yes, it looked like Jesus was angry. But the Bible says angry, anger is not a sin, right? We know that. So the Bible says being anger, be angry, but do not sin. So we can be angry. Anger is a result of what we feel is unjust, something that's wrong, and we're angry. How we act is the bigger issue. So in a way, the entire first advent of Jesus, that is that his first birth on earth, his first coming to earth, was a foreshadowing of his entire second advent of Jesus. John and Jesus were blurring the lines between Old Testament prophecy and its New Testament fulfillment. They were blurring the lines between God's plans for yesterday, today, and the future. So we see in chapter 1 of, of John, we see John the Baptist and Jesus. John the Baptist came to prepare the people for the light. He was not the light, but came to point others to the light. Remember that? Also, in John chapter 1, Jesus is the light. So we have this John and Jesus, John the Baptist, Jesus the Messiah. There's John, the, the messenger of the light, Jesus the light. Then we get, I want you to look at, think about Malachi. Malachi chapter 3, if you want to turn there or just jot this down, because I'd love for you to go back and look at this a little later when you have more time. But these are prophecies and foretellings, foretastes, foreshadowing of what's yet to come. John and Jesus are prophesied about. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way for me. Who do you think that is? And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to the temple. Who do you think that might be? John the first, the messenger, and Jesus coming to the temple. And the messenger of the covenant, that's Jesus, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So in Malachi chapter 3, the first part of verse 1, God's first messenger would come to prepare the way of the Lord. That would be John the Baptist. He uses those very words in John chapter 1, verse 23. I proclaim and prepare the way of the Lord. And then in chapter 3 and verse 1, the second part of verse 1, God's second messenger, he uses messenger for both of them, but the second messenger is clarified as the messenger of the covenant. Jesus was the messenger of the new covenant. 
Also, this speaks of Christ's first appearing on earth and birth as Jesus as his and Jesus as his and his crucifixion. It also refers to the coming of the Lord of hosts as the second advent when Christ himself returns with great power and great glory to put an end to transgressions and usher in righteousness upon the earth. Daniel chapter 9. So in John chapter 1, there was John and Jesus. In Malachi, his prophecies were about the messenger proclaiming the uh, preparing the way of the Lord. And Jesus, doesn't say Jesus, but it was referring to Jesus as the second messenger, being the messenger of the covenant. And then we go on and look at verse 2. More prophecies about, about Jesus. Malachi chapter 3, verse 2. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? That is the Lord's coming, the, the Lord Jesus' coming. For he is like a refiner's fire and the fuller's soap. This is a prophecy of Jesus cleansing the temple. And Jesus cleansing the temple was a partial fulfillment of that prophecy, but a foretaste of another prophecy that would be, would be fulfilled in greater measure. He will be like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. So the second mention, mention here is the Lord himself in the person of Christ and refers to the prophecy of Jesus cleansing the temple. So this is a reminder, number one, of God's promises. Also, of Christ's cleansing of the temple is a foreshadowing of the future representation of the second coming that Malachi, we just read about Malachi. The second coming when God comes to purify his people on the earth. The second advent is the return of Christ when he purifies, refines his people during the thousand year reign on earth. And much like in the days, in the last days, when the fires and trials of persecution are burning in Israel, yet the whole world is scorched with its heat, so in the last days the return of Christ will purge and purify and bring righteousness back to God's people, so he will also purify the earth and bring all people unto him with his or in during his thousand year reign. So Jesus, we might think, oh, Jesus was being mean-spirited. He was being a harsh person. This was a, this was basically baby, baby care uh, as it was foreshadowing what was going to come. This is Jesus foreshadowing the second coming when he comes with great power and great glory to purge his people and purify their sins and to draw them all back into right relationship with him. So we see John the Baptist and Jesus, the messenger and the Messiah. And back to John, back to the Gospel of John, these signs sparked faith. After the resurrection of Christ, it all came together for a lot of people. And many, John says, after Jesus was crucified and after he was raised... It all came together. The prophecies, Jesus' death and resurrection, the signs and their faith. It's like, wow. After he was raised, many people believed and came to faith. And yet at the same time, John 2 verse 23 says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in him believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. So there were some people that when Jesus was there, again, there were other signs he was doing. When he performed those signs, they, read, they understood that he's not just a man. His identity is, is deity. He's divine. This is making me want to trust in him, believe in him, but also is pointing towards some future event. Or, or prophecy that was yet to come regarding the kingdom of heaven. 
And so people believed then, but some did not believe until after Jesus was dead and raised from the dead. And then it all kind of came together and made sense, and they believed and were saved. So then it comes to, Jesus refers to my father's house, my father's house. One of the uh, concerning things was that it tells us that the people's heart had began to stray away from God as father. John chapter 4, this is, this is the people's perspective. John chapter 4, as Jesus is talking with a woman at the well, it says, The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with water. And Jesus was there to get water. He asked the woman for a drink. She says, There's nothing here for you to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? So the Israelites considered Jacob as their father, as the father of the Jewish people. And then in chapter 8, Talking to the Pharisees, Jesus says, I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Then they answered, Abraham is our father. So they believe Jacob was their father, father of the Jewish people. They believe Abraham was father, father of the Jewish people. But what have they done with the father in heaven? They sure don't seem very close to him. Their forefathers, our religious leaders, are called father, but their relationship with God remains very formal. Worship is cold, and their lives seem untouched and unmoved by their father in heaven. This should move each of us to consider our own worship before God. We should consider each our own personal relationship with God through Jesus. What is my spiritual life like? What am I doing with Jesus? Or what is Jesus doing with me? How is he working in my life? What are the many ways in which God displays his faithfulness, reveals his presence and glory in each of our lives every single day? How is my worship in my personal relationship of the Lord? We should be thinking about that and evaluating. So we look at these signs. The signs is what made these people believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. What sign do you show us for doing these things? They asked Jesus. In other words, the people were saying, prove to us who you really are. Give us a sign. Jesus said, I'll give you a sign. When I die, I'll be raised from the dead. Then that'll be a sign. Then, then you will believe. For us today, if we believe in Jesus and are following him, I believe it's only a matter of time before God does something miraculous in your life and my life, and we get a sign. Not that we all have signs and wonders all over the place, but we have an encounter, and that is a sign that God is interested and involved in your life. Not that we have to have signs that would match something in the Bible. Yet God does intervene in our lives and he works in many ways that when we encounter him it is outside the normal realm of what typically happens. It's, we would say, supernatural. And that is oftentimes how God works in our lives. He works in the lives of his people, and he's working and he's active in your life and my life today. And sometimes God himself or Jesus himself kind of blurs the lines between that which is physical or that which is secular and makes something spiritual or sacred out of it. I just want to tell you a story, and then I'll be closing, but... A week, couple of weeks ago, two to three weeks ago, somebody dropped off another bicycle up here to our next behind our storage container. You know, I quit taking bikes, you know, at the end of the summer. So when one gets dropped off, or dropped off over there, I just take it and put it behind the the the, the trailer, and I'm going to call the junk people to come and get it. And so I just grabbed that bike and pushed it over there, just kind of glancing at the bike, and I noticed it did have good gears. Noticed it had nice gears. That catches my attention. So anyway, I put it in the junk pile. 
The next day, everybody with me? The next day, <laughs> the next day, the high school calls me and says, we hear you used to have bicycles. Do you have a bicycle? That we, we have a special needs student that needs a bicycle. I says, no, I don't have a bicycle. This is where my mind was. I said, nope, got no bikes. But I'll be looking for them. Well, I hung up, and immediately I thought, that bike. So I ran back up there, and I just looked the bike over. I thought, wow, this is a pretty good bike. So I went back, called the vice principal back up. I said, you know what? I do have a bike for you. I do have a bike for you. And uh, I said, I'll, I'll get it ready to go, and, I'll, and, and we'll get it and take it to this student. And I asked the principal, I said, can I take it? Can we do this together? And he says, I'm not going to be able to this week because I got to this, that, after school. I can't do it. But I'll let you do it if you don't mind doing it. You be our emissary. You take the bike to the people. He gave me their number to call them, the address, and everything. So I got the bike ready. I took it yesterday. Took it yesterday up around Edinburgh somewhere. <coughs> went there. The kid got on the bike, and he was just jumping for joy. This kid was so excited. His dad was, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I said, well, I got to tell you, I got to tell you the story behind the bike. This is how God blurs the, the secular with the spiritual and the sacred. I said, somebody donated this bike about three days ago your principal vice principal called me the day after and asked me if I had a bicycle for you I said the Bible tells us that God knows what we need before we even ask I had your bicycle before anybody even asked me for it in fact I trashed it I threw it in the garbage because I didn't want it didn't think I needed it and then the principal calls and I fix it up this kid was so happy. You know what he said? We're Christians. We go to Denny Chapel. I says, no kidding. <laughs> but they were so thrilled. So anyway, that, the bike, secular, physical, non-spiritual, gets all blurry. Suddenly this thing is an instrument of ministry, brought joy to this child, allowed us to have a little bit of fellowship. That's the way God does. God is a master at blurring the lines between the secular and the sacred if we just open our minds and open our eyes to see that. Uh, in closing, in closing, we want to sing a beautiful song. Take the name of Jesus with you, right, Ted? Right. Beautiful song. And I encourage you to be thinking, be thinking about the actual content of these verses. I did that uh, this week. And I was looking at it. So take the name of Jesus with you. As we're doing it, I want to use this as a closing. Take the name of Jesus with you is all about our daily encounters with Jesus. As you sing this, be thinking about, that's like a daily encounter. So take the name of Jesus with you is all about our daily encounters with Jesus. About remembering Jesus in our daily activities. Taking Jesus, the name of Jesus with you. And the lines between sorrow and joy will begin to blur. Take the name of Jesus with you and the lines between our trials and blessings become blurry. Take the name of Jesus with you along the secular travels of this life. And you'll find the, the lines blurring between this life and the promises of heaven with the Lord. Take the name of Jesus with you. And see what God will do as he opens our eyes to the people around us and the things that he is doing. Taking the secular and making something beautifully sacred out of it. <coughs> Holy Father, we thank you so much, Lord. What an exciting thing to, to think about what you're doing and, and what you want to do through us. And Lord, if we can just get our eyes off ourselves and our eyes on you and trusting you for our difficulties, our problems, our challenges, our trials, our sorrows. Lord, help us to, to always be looking to you. Help us to always be have a mind open to be used by you, Lord. Uh, bless us to always be thinking about 
what you might doing might be doing, Lord, not just in our life, but using us to touch another life. Lord, this, is, this has been an absolute exhilarating week for me, just something as simple as that. And, uh, Lord, just uh, to, to know how you orchestrated it without doubt, Lord, that was a sign. <laughs> that was a sign. That was an unmistakable miracle of God at work, intervening in this situation, uh, infiltrating this people's family, encouraging their hearts, especially this young fella, and uh, offering a time of fellowship. Lord, thank you again so very much. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together. for church family life. Remember, uh, if you got this, you, everyone should have gotten uh, one of these. Uh, please use that as a, a guide, something to look at maybe before you vote. And also, Ted and I both got some tracks for Halloween. And if you'd like some Halloween tracks to put in uh, those little uh, children's bags, treat bags, they're out here on the larger table in the middle of the foyer. You can take them, they're free. And uh, I was ordering tracks and realized I could buy a kid's Bible online for the same price of a track. A full ESV Bible. So I'm going to be giving those out at Halloween. I'm going to see how that works. 
But anyway, you're not going to get those. I'm going to take those myself. But there are lots of tracks out here, some glow-in-the-dark tracks, those cartoon tracks, guaranteed everybody looks at them and reads them. So I encourage you to get some of those if you plan on having trick and treat trick-or-treaters. Give them some good candy. And if you got something, blare some loud children's Christian music over the radio when they're coming up to the porch. That's what I like to do. So think about that for Halloween. Don't run from the darkness. Let's, let's, let's use the darkness for the kingdom of heaven. Lord, we thank you today. We thank you for your goodness. Bless us to be your servants, Lord, and I pray that there may be some here today that just those lines aren't blurred quite yet. And they need to see that, you're, that, that, that the line is blurry between their troubles and your provisions because you're there with them. Lord, that uh, their situation is not beyond your control. What's going on in their life is not beyond your attention. I pray for each of us today, Lord, whatever needs that we have, we would find them fully met in our Lord Jesus. And we'll thank you and trust you for that in Christ's name. Amen.